on a trip out of town last fall in 2020. I was driving at night, and as I drove, I actually saw a shooting star. It's rare, and I'm not talking about a little bitty thing that just zoop across the heavens, and that's about it, and that's all you get. No, this for a moment, I'm sure you've seen, and especially around the time of uh, New Year's when you have a lot of fireworks, sometimes you'll see them uh, being shot up and they'll explode, or, or you'll have Roman candles uh, that shoot uh, light from and stuff out of there, out of the end of the uh, stick. That is, if you can get your Roman candle to light and work, uh, most of the ones I've ever tried to fire, boom, that's about it. That's all you get. So I, I, I like, I will watch them, but I don't uh, really care to participate anymore. It's just for me, it just doesn't work out. But then that's just me. Um, but with that said, more like a bottle rocket going up and just for a moment, then poof. Well, as I drove in my pickup truck uh, that night, as I was getting um, where I was heading, I noticed in the sky, and it had a, a greenish tinge. I don't know if that means it has a lot of copper in it or not. I have no idea. Uh, I'm not a metallurgist, but I watched it as it came across, and then it just poofed, and that was it. Oh, I'm not saying a ooh, UFO. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying it was a... a, it was a um, a, I won't say cosmic phenomenon, but it was a phenomena in the night sky. I don't get to see a shooting star that intense uh, that often. In fact, it's been a long time since I've seen something like that. They can be illuminating and obviously impressive. Uh, many of you have seen the Perseid meteor showers at different times in your life. That's where a lot of things are uh, in the heavens going off uh, and going over, uh, streaking across. And, of course, I remember in 1986, Halley's Comet, which comes about, um, about every 70-ish years, sometimes 75, but I think it's about, about 70 years. And I, I remember Halley's Comet visited us in 1986. There were a lot of <coughs> prophecies related to that one because comets and shooting stars and other things are often uh, in in ancient times and even sometimes in modern times associated as harbingers or omens of disaster and catastrophe. So you can understand that a star shining in the east would have gotten the attention of a lot of people. Um, now, how accurate or not uh, comets and shooting stars and other such are in terms of uh, it being a phenomena of that harbinger some type of gloom and doom or some type of good news is debatable. But what is not debatable is that the wise men from the east saw a phenomena in the night sky. In fact, one expert says, and I quote, one popular theory regarding the star of Bethlehem is that Halley's comet seen in the Holy Land around the time of Christ's birth might have been taken as an omen by the Magi. Several objections to this idea that are difficult to overcome. However, it is now known to, that Halley's Comet did appear, or a comet did appear, over the Middle East in 12 BC, showing up at latitude 31 degrees north, almost the precise latitude of Bethlehem, end quote. As we think about a phenomenon, as we think about wise men then and wise men now, wise men came to Jesus following his lead, following his star, to give of themselves unto him. And wise people today come to Jesus, and they follow his lead to give of themselves unto him. As I said, the star of Bethlehem was a phenomenon, and we're going to look at that in just a moment. It's at once intriguing, inspiring, and instructive. And so we would ask the Lord, show us what we could uh, apply in our lives this Christmas of 2021. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 2, verse 1 and following. Matthew chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. I'll be reading from the New King James. Your translation may read a little bit different. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For well, we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ, the Messiah, was to be born. So they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, and that prophet is Isaiah, and, as, no, wrong one, it is uh, the prophet Malachi, you know, making sure I get my right, Micah? Yes, that is correct. I have... 
Let's see, best, uh, best uh, one out of three. So let's try it the last time, shall we? It is the prophet Micah who is sharing the prophecy of the birthplace of Bethlehem. So uh, Isaiah is quoted a lot. Malachi is in there for another reason, but for the Christmas purposes, it is the book of, uh, it is the prophet Micah. All right, now that we've had that little Bible lesson, let's move on. In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child. And when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. When they heard the king, they departed. And behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced and with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Then, being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. May God bless the reading of his word. I would have you note that wise men get to Jesus. Wise men get to Jesus. And these wise men, as Brother Gary shared, it's not necessarily just three men on camel uh, traveling across the desert. That's your Hallmark uh, holiday card image, but it could have been a entourage, quite a few most likely, because you would have traveled in numbers, safety in numbers. And so they are following this phenomenon, this star, and it is, number one, an intriguing star. Dr. Ralph Earl, who is a, who is a Bible uh, expert in the languages, uh, as he addresses the, the wise men, uh, which is from the word magi, or magoi, or magoi, it depends on how you pronounce that, and you get the word loosely translated magician from that, most likely were astrologers. Now, some do, would dispute that and say they were astronomers. I would say probably a little bit of both. There's always something of a fine line uh, from Persia, Babylonia, and possibly even Arabia. It's not stated how many that they were, but the key thing was that the star intrigued them. And with the knowledge that they possess, and they knew that they had to follow it to its logical outcome. Many theories abound to, uh, as to what this star was. Some say it was a comet or an alignment of planets, maybe even a supernova, some type of uh, event of that situation. But the, the problem with that is that the science and the timeline in Scripture do not agree. Now, either we do not have all the information today that was available then, and that's very possibly likely the case, or there may be a better explanation. In fact, the late Jesuit uh, scholar, Cardinal Danilou, accepted the theory that the star was one in a messianic horoscope, the star being an allusion to a star rising or in the ascendant in its particular house. He actually wrote, and I quote, in those Jewish circles of the day in which astrology was widespread and the Messiah hoped for, there was speculation as to the star or to the star under which the Messiah would be born. It becomes clear that once the combination foretold in one of these horoscopes actually took place, people would believe that the Messiah was born and would start to look for his birthplace, end quote. It's possible. Uh, the Magi, um, some would say that they were a priestly group of people, and very likely in, in some of the countries of the East, which would include Persia and Babylon and obviously Arabia, uh, they even rose, according to Dr. Daniel Aiken, uh, to positions of great influence. They were uh, learned men, they were educated, and therefore with education came authority, and with authority came respect and influence. These were men who are not just mythical superstitious people practicing some type of uh, uh, some type of witchcraft although uh, obviously dealing with astrology and horoscope does uh, put you in that uh, in that category of the occult so don't have anything to do with that and that's the way scripture warns us to stay away from that but yes uh, as they uh, would have had knowledge when they began to make their calculations as I said I suspect it was a fine line one foot in the world of astronomy which is a science, and one foot probably dabbling in the world of astrology, which is more of a mysticism at, at the very best. 
And yet they knew enough to be able to begin to calculate and say, we, we need to follow this. It was an intriguing star. Dr. John MacArthur, who is a Bible scholar and teacher, uh, he also uh, has uh, many books out. Um, I would encourage you to read uh, his work. You may not always agree with him. I don't always agree with him, but that he's still very, very solid. Others, even myself included, believe that the star was not a stellar phenomenon as much as it was a supernatural phenomenon, a manifestation of the presence and power and glory of God for a specific purpose and occasion. God saying, I am doing something new and I am fulfilling promises going all the way back to Genesis when he said to Adam and to Eve that of her seed would come one to crush the head of the serpent even though the serpent would strike or bruise his heel. The, the proto-evangelium, the very first reference of a Savior thus the very first reference of the gospel uh, in a nutshell, in a sentence really, and it flows through. You have the pillar, the column of cloud by day, the, the column of fire by night, and other Bible references with the tabernacle, which is the tent, the worship tent, as well as the temple, uh, you have what is called, and you've heard me say it a few Sundays ago, the Shekinah glory of God. All that means is a, a, a smoky cloud-like uh, manifestation that is associated with God's presence in an unusual fashion. Uh, it is, you might say, a theophany. That is, God manifesting himself in, in the not norm way uh, and such. And uh, it is very likely then that the star, because it's not indicated in Scripture or even by tradition that it just shined and shined and shined for a long time, but that it was there in the night sky and maybe the daytime sky too for a while and then it's gone, but then it suddenly reappears. Comets don't do that. Uh, shooting stars don't do that. Um, planetary alignments don't do that. A supernova, they're saying that if I think the planet, not planet, wrong one, if the star Betelgeuse, which is a red giant, extremely ancient, uh, there's indications that it might be about to go supernova. You, you and I, if that happens, we will see it in the day and in the nighttime sky for probably the, the majority of a year if that happens in our lifetime and such. Well, this does not seem to be the case. It says in Matthew 2, 9 and 10, Till it, the star, came and stood over where the young child was. Then they saw the star. They rejoiced with exceeding great joy. So uh, let's look at it as a phenomenon that is supernatural. God manifesting himself, fulfilling scripture, directing these wise men, these magi, these learned men, to the very location where the Messiah is. Now, uh, that also, uh, uh, we love our Hallmark ho uh, holiday cards that have the baby Jesus and that has the shepherds and that has the wise men all at one time. And that's a wonderful picture to have. Biblically accurate, it took them some time to get there. It's not, unless they started way early, uh, it took them several months to travel. And as they would have traveled, uh, you're, you're finding that he's not necessarily in the manger at this point. He is in a house, whether it's a rented house or whether it's... Because uh, Mary would have had to have had a few, uh, several days, uh, several weeks actually, to recover from childbirth, plus to go to the temple uh, for her own ceremonial purification. Then there's the taking of Jesus to the temple for him to be circumcised, and at, as a result of that, to legally receive his name, Yeshua, or Jesus, which means... Uh, Jesus, or God saves. It's not just a one and done and they're on the road. I mean, there's some time that passes. We're not told how much. It could be as little as six months. It may have been, as I suspect, about a year, maybe a year and a half. Because when Herod gives the order to kill the children in Bethlehem, it's two years old and younger. So he's going to take out any perceived threat. But the star was intriguing, and irregardless whether it's a stellar phenomenon or a supernatural phenomenon, it caught their attention. So let's apply this this morning about this intriguing star. The key point is that it got their attention just as the Lord got the attention of the shepherds, as he also had the attention of Mary and Joseph. Now he has the attention of these wise men. Does he have your attention? Does he have our attention this Christmas? Do we share and do we live out a scriptural witness that calls people's attention to Jesus Christ? Not attention to Chunky Baptist Church, although, hey, I, I, I think having good PR is good. That's, I'm not saying have, have a bad PR, okay? 
but it's not about attention on us as a church. It's not about attention on you and me as individual believers. It is about us as a church family pointing the attention to Jesus Christ because in Him and Him only is their power. In Him and Him only is their forgiveness. In Him and Him only is their salvation. Amen. Thank you. Does the star of the Savior intrigue you and I today? It's so easy to get caught up in the cares and concerns. We've had enough of them in 2021, I can assure you. But does it intrigue us today? And all that the star of Bethlehem represents, does it intrigue us today enough to take it seriously? In fact, the question is for some, have you seen his star not shining in the night sky as a phenomenon, but have you seen his star in the pages of Scripture pointing you to Jesus Christ? If you have, then praise him today and continue to seek him because wise men seek Jesus, wise women seek Jesus. But if you do not know Christ or if there's a doubt about whether or not you know Christ, then I invite you, no, I urge you and implore you to begin your journey today, not to the uh, foreign lands of the west or to the east, but rather to the altar to say, Lord Jesus, I see you for the very first time, and I ask you to be Savior and Lord just as you were born to be and just as you are even for all eternity. The Bible says in Numbers 24, 17, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star will come forth from Jacob, and a scepter, a symbol of royal power and authority, will arise from Israel. So this star, as it relates to the wise men, is also an instructive star. Regardless of its substance or its source, they understood, that is, the wise men understood the significance. They knew they had to follow its direction. they <coughs> Excuse me. When you think about the wise men, you say, well, if they were astrologers in the classical sense of the word, why would they we even care about Jewish prophecy? Let's flash back in time to when the Israelites, or specifically the kingdom of Judah and the city of Jerusalem, fell uh, to Nebuchadnezzar. And so he begins over a course of time to forcibly relocate hundreds and hundreds of citizens from the very leading to some who are the very lowest. Although a remnant remained, that's true, but uh, a large number were forcibly relocated and of course Babylon is one of the areas and they stayed there and they're there for 70 years. Some people were young when they got there, were now old when the opportunity to return. Not everybody returned to Jerusalem. Many did, and they rebuilt Jerusalem by the grace of God and, and set into motion what would become uh, that little dash between Malachi and Matthew is about 430 years of Jewish history. Uh, that is intriguing. There's a, a time of Jewish independence even. Uh, there is a kingdom called the Hasmonean kingdom. Uh, you, if you're familiar with the... In the uh, well, we don't have it in our Bible, but there are some Bible editions that are out there that has what is called the Apocrypha. And you have the first, second, and third book of Maccabees. While I will not preach from it, because I do not believe it to be the inspired word of God, the scripture, well, rather the, what is written is, is inspiring history. of It details the war for Jewish independence, which led to the cleansing of the temple, which brings about a little holiday that is similar to ours in Christian circles. It's called Hanukkah. Uh, which is, of course, the uh, Festival of Lights, associated with that time, a really a phenomenal time that, that begins to, to edge towards, obviously, Bethlehem as the convergence of prophecy. Well, you would have a large number of Jews who have stayed behind. That was their home. They had businesses there. They, they had uh, investments there. They had money there. And as a result, you would have had some who, if they became astronomers and they became the wise men that in that uh, situation, they would have been very, very much aware of Jewish teaching and Jewish prophecy and the, the hope and the desire and the expectation for a true Messiah as had been promised. Because by, in the year 63 B.C., General Pompey comes in, uh, intervenes, or actually he was invited in, but more of an invasion, during a Jewish civil war of the Hasmonean dynasty. And that's what leads to, ultimately to the rise of King Herod and the New Testament as we know it. An amazing uh, time. And the Magi would have, uh, for political reasons, 
who would have been aware that Messiah could be born at any time. And so when they see this and, and they're doing the math and they understand the significance, they're going to head in that direction. They're going to also do it for religious reasons as well because this is a, a religious moment. It's a spiritual event in their life. In fact, there was a generation of magi according to legend, not necessarily according to the scripture or, or history as we know it, but according to legend, a group of magi or wise men who had seen a cosmic phenomenon that they associated with the birth of Alexander the Great. So it's not uh, outside the realm of, of probability that this group of wise men they're intrigued, but they're instructed. They know what they need to do. They know how to do it. They use their astrometrical skills. They, if they used astrology, we were reminded in the book of Numbers that God took a flawed false prophet by the name of Balaam who had been hired by King Balak to bring curses or to pronounce curses upon uh, the, the people of Israel before they're getting really uh, ready to go into the land of promise or the land of Canaan. And God encounters uh, Balaam and basically uh, there is a one-on-one -on -one encounter and he says, uh, if you go any further, I will kill you and you will not bring curses upon my people, but you will speak as I instruct you to speak. And so Balaam, who is in the presence of power he has never seen in his life, uh, wisely agrees. And so every time he goes to what would have been a curse, he, he blesses Israel because God can take the base things of this world, the, the despised things of this world, the, the weak things, even the foolish things of this world, and he can use them to glorify his name. He can use them to accomplish his purpose, the Bible says. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. It goes on to say that no flesh should glory in his presence. 1 Corinthians 1, 27 through 29. These wise men, if they were dabbling in the dark side, if you want to use that term loosely, God can still use them. I suspect, like I said, a fine line between astromet, uh, astro, let's try it again, astronomy on one side side and the more traditional astrology on the other. They knew more than the learned men that are surrounded Herod. Imagine you're the king of Judea, you're Herod, and you're not seeing three men in robes on camels just trot up to the palace. You're seeing an entourage coming, and, and that's uh, if they're traveling in numbers. And it could have been quite a few wise men, but they're going to send representatives into the court of the king. And they come in there, and I'm sure with all due deference and respect, but they ask this question, where is he born king of the Jews? Because we've seen his star in the east, and we've come to worship. It's a slap in the face because Herod owed his dynasty. He owed his crown, not because he was a member of the royal family of David. He had no biological connection. According to um, uh, history, Herod came from a family that had been converted to Judaism. He was from Idumea, which has connection to the Edomites, by the way, which they were not on good terms with Israel. And he is a convert to Judaism, but he's not, he's not of the royal family. And his father uh, was a ruler important person, influencer, who makes sure that his son gets promoted. And so his son, who is a master manipulator, gets himself appointed king of Judea. And he is a brutal king. Although he does undertake the rebuild and restore uh, the temple of Zerubbabel, which itself was a rebuild of the temple of Solomon, it's a 46-year building campaign that was still ongoing when Jesus and the disciples are holding a, pre a teaching time on the temple uh, courtyard grounds. But Herod would have been acutely aware that he is not the true rightful king. And he has just been reminded of that in the presence of everybody. Where is he born king? They, Jesus was of, a, of the true biological bloodline. He was of the true prophetic uh, bloodline. Herod was the son of a ruler of Idumea, small region uh, in southern Israel, a Jew by conversion, that is, he had adopted the Jewish religion, but he's not a Jew by faith, and he certainly has no faith in the prophecies that a Savior has been born even for him. The Magi, I suspect, showed all deference and respect, honoring King Herod's position. If I were to be invited to the White House this, uh, this morning and I were able to fly to Washington, D.C. to meet with the president, I would be, you know, it would be an honor, even though we might not agree with politics and we might not agree with direction the country is going in, but I will show all deference and respect to the office of the President of the United States of America because he 
thinks that he or one day she is the president of the United States of America. You don't show disrespect. The Bible says you ought to show respect. I suspect that they showed the, the proper respect, but they came, and while they may have honored Herod, they came to pay homage to the true king. Let's apply that this morning, Chunky. We do not depend on a star today. We depend on God, the Holy Spirit, to instruct us and to direct us in our lives, and He does instruct us today. But are we paying attention to the where and to the when and to the what and to the whom that He would have us to pay attention to? Do we pay mere respect to the Lord? Or do we genuinely and honestly worship the Lord? In 2022, by the time we get to December 26, 2022, let it be said of Chunky Baptist Church that we have honored the Lord, that we have paid homage to Him, that we have worshipped our King. The Bible says, serve the Lord with fear. That is a, a, a very uh, deep, holy reverence. And Rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all those who put their trust in him. Psalm 2, verse 11 and 12. That is a messianic psalm, by the way, pointing to Jesus Christ because he came to be not just the little baby in the manger that we celebrate today. He came to be the sacrifice for your sin and my sin he came to be the sovereign who has complete and total dominance over our life. Whether we want to or not, he is, but we are blessed if we yield to him. In 1984, there was a solar eclipse event. Uh, I wasn't really paying attention to the news, but I was home at my grandmother's house. And I remember glancing out the window that the blue sky was getting a rich, rich color blue, getting darker by the moment. And the birds that had been chirping just minutes earlier got ominously quiet. And the little dog that was in the house, we had a feist dog by the name of Duke, black, black uh, fur with a white, he looked like he was wearing a, a tux all the time. And so he comes running, finds me. He's whimpering and whining because he's not sure. So I scooped him up and I sat on the steps going up to the upstairs section of my grandparents' house where I lived looking out this window, thinking obviously that biblically the end of the world was here. And I'm going to have a front row seat to see it. Awesome. No, actually, it was a little terrifying, to be honest with you. And then it got better, and I'm like, what has happened? I turned on the news. I turned on what I thought was a reliable source of news at the time, CNN. Not so much today, but that's just me. Anyway, with that said, a um, little shout out there. But with that said, uh, had I paid attention to the news earlier that week, had I you know, been informed, I might would have been better prepared and could have actually had the safety glasses or film that you needed to actually view uh, the, the solar eclipse in 1984. Wise men used their brains to follow their hearts as they were guided by the star of Bethlehem. And as we're preparing to, to close this in just a moment, it was an inspiring star. The event was so amazing that these men their entourage. Some may have, a, there's a, a TV miniseries I dearly love from 1978. I have the DVD copy of it. It's called Jesus of Nazareth. And in that scene, it shows groups of wise men, actually uh, caravans coming from what would be the direction of Babylon and from Persia and even up from Arabia, all converging outside the palace of King Herod. And of course, they send representatives in to speak to the king. Either Either way, whether it's a small group or a large group, the thing is that these people were inspired to go. They were inspired to worship. That was their professed purpose, to come. And when they did, as the star reappeared, and they come to the, to the house where, where the young child is, and there's Mary and perhaps Joseph, I would believe, would be there as well, or he may have been working, they rejoice and were exceedingly glad, and, and they worship, they give of themselves of the, the gold, the frankincense, and the myrrh. These are expensive gifts. They are exquisite gifts. They are excellent gifts, fit for a, dare I say it, king. Gifts that I believe that God provided so that Mary and Joseph would be able to provide for the family uh, for their two years that they will spend in Egypt as they flee from the rage of King Herod. But these men were inspired to come. These men were inspired to give. And as Daniel Aiken would say, they were able to catch by faith what the learned scribes and chief priests did not. And Herod saw a threat to be eliminated 
rather than a savior to be accepted. Their journey was a personal journey. Each one chose this. Nobody made the wise men go. Nobody forced them to saddle up and go. They chose. And then it was also uh, a pertinent journey. It was consequential. It was consequential for them. It changed their lives. It changed the trajectory of their lives. And it was a perilous journey. I suspect the trip over was not without risk. The trip back home was not without risk. And they're warned divinely in a dream, don't go back to Herod. I suspect had they done so, there would have been the wrath of God upon them. They knew, and so they went another route. So as we close this this morning, let's apply this as well. The Christmas story ought to inspire our desire for Jesus, who is the desire of nations and inspire our desire to proclaim Jesus to these very nations. The fact that we gave 43.15 uh, for Lottie Moon is an amazing thing as we're still uh, going through a, a difficult and uncertain time. Does Chris, the Christmas story, not necessarily the star or even the wise men, but the entire Christmas narrative, does it inspire us looking ahead to 2022? The Holy Spirit directs people to Jesus today, and like the Magi, are we inspired to go and get to Jesus any way we can, even if none go with us, even if we go alone, or even if we have to go in a small group? Now, I'm not saying, oh, we got to load up and get on a plane, fly to Jerusalem. That's not what I'm saying. But rather, in our walk with the Lord today, are we willing, whatever it takes, to get to Jesus, to be with Jesus, to be a part of His will, to be carrying out His purpose and plan, are we so inspired that we will do whatever it takes to get to Jesus? Because wise men and women get to Jesus. They also give to Jesus, by the way. They, um, they give of themselves. They give the best of themselves, of their time, of their, their energy, their, their talent, their time, all those things. And that's what the, the, the Magi, I believe, teach us. The Holy Spirit directs us to worship Christ today. Like the Magi, are we inspired to come and worship the King of Kings? Is it the driving force of your life and my life? There are a lot of things that push us, a lot of things that drive us, a lot of things that, woohoo, look at me! Whether we should be saying, you know, the force of my life, whether it's in the mighty or the mundane, it's going to be on Jesus. And I'm going to be saying, woohoo, look at Jesus! Look at Jesus who rose again. Look at Jesus who lived a sinless life. Look at Jesus who was born of the virgin in, in that manger and who was born for you today. Wise people get to Jesus. Wise people get right with Jesus. And wise people get busy for Jesus. Which are you? Today, I invite you to come to this altar as our worship leaders come to lead us in this time of invitation. If you have any question about where do you stand with the Lord Jesus Christ, today is a wonderful day to nail it down. There's no reason to go through life with a, I don't know, or I hope so. I promise you, eternity is too long to have a, uh-oh. There is no uh-oh. You either know so or you don't know so. If you're not sure, come to this altar today. I will be happy to walk with you, talk with you, pray with you, share scripture with you, or better yet, I will be happy to get out of the way and let you do business with God. But come today as the Lord leads you to come this morning. And then it may be that the Lord is calling you to make a specific decision to maybe unite with this church. You will find arms open wide. Let nothing hold you back if you have the peace of God to be a part. God may be calling some of you to make a specific decision in terms of service to Him, and He wants you to make it public. I invite you to do so. You are among family and friends, and nobody is going to laugh at you. And if they do, well, so what? I mean, really, uh, what you do, you do for the King of Kings. Wise men get to Jesus. Wise women get to Jesus. Get to Jesus this morning if that is what He is calling you to do. Let us stand as we sing our hymn of invitation.